Now, if Pete makes a good point, you have to inch up, and those are the most frustrating people because when it does turn, you got to be in the middle there if you're the first car so you can make it on the red, you can make that turn, at least making it better for the person behind you next time got to. when it finally turns. Yeah. The people that don't inch take that, that extra car should be able to go on every cyclical light uh, there is. And those those people should be jailed. <laughs> That's the way I felt today. Man, I was it was like uh anything that could have gone wrong, I was falling behind them. I mean, I was driving down Arctic Avenue in Atlantic City today, going northbound, and they were paving the street. Uh that was a great time to pick to pave the street, you know, like, you know, ten o'clock in the morning on a Friday. That's like the perfect time when there's no traffic. Uh, so that thing was backed up, man. A 15-minute ride took me about 45 minutes. And then I got the left-hand turn lane that just, I mean, I saw that thing flash before me twice today. I mean, God, I got nailed by that thing twice. But I digress, and we get ready for the so, so, <laughs> so Murphy's Law basically took a day off from circling around the Eagles' offense to circle around. <laughs> That is true. And the bye week breakdown, yesterday we talked about the linebackers. Like, you conveniently did all the good parts on the defensive side of the ball during the bye week because the defensive line has been a really good unit. And uh, I'll tell you, have they exceeded expectations? I mean, I know we all looked at Michael, uh, excuse me, Fletcher Cox as uh, a guy that we were, you know, pretty uh, hopeful becoming like the, the leader of uh, the star of that group. Uh, but has this group exceeded expectations? Uh, I don't think so. I think this is the one group that has played as expected. You knew they were going to be pretty good, and I think they have been pretty good. Uh, so it's not an insult to say they haven't exceeded expectations. We just expected them to be uh, a really solid unit, and that's what they've turned out to be. Uh, but I don't think anybody, with the possible exception uh, of Fletcher, I think he's elevated his game at least a little bit to now. I, I compared he's he was a Pro Bowl player before. Now he's been basically an All Pro player. Uh, and Benny Logan versus the run at least has really stepped it up. Uh, but overall, you know they're a good group, and we expected them to be a good group. And I, I think they've lived up to the building. Billy exceeded it to this point. All right, uh, yeah, as he's done all week with the secondary and the linebackers, uh, MVP not going to happen, disappointments, better days. Let's go uh, to the MVP because, you know, obviously there's a couple of choices here with Fletcher Cox being the main one, but a lot of people like what Benny Logan has done, and some would say, well, if not for Logan, maybe Cox doesn't do what he does, uh, but which way do you think, uh, who has been the MVP so far? Yeah, I go the opposite. I think it's pretty clear that Fletcher Cox is the best player the Eagles have. I mean, if you rated this roster from 1 to 53, which I'll do after the season, Fletcher Cox so far is going to be number one. He's the best pure football player the Eagles have. Uh, and that's not a shot at Benny Logan. It's just, you know, Benny is very good, as I said, against the run. But to this point, he's he's still one-dimensional. He doesn't get enough push. Uh, interior push on the pass rush, and that's a concern. So even though he's gotten better and better and he keeps progressing and he's been lights out basically versus the run, uh, until he takes that next step as a pass rusher, uh, I think that kind of holds him back a little bit. All right, John, uh, better days to come. Uh, A lot of candidates here. One would be uh, Cedric Thornton, who was hurt, missed some times. Brandon Bear's a guy that we forgot about because uh, he batted down about – 10 passes it seemed like in about two games and then hasn't dressed because he's been hurt uh you got the young guys like taylor hart uh, who hasn't done a whole heck of a lot uh or there could be uh, another guy that could be in line for a much better second half of the year yeah and i kind of went with benny because i think he's got the biggest ceiling i think he could turn into that pro bowl type player uh if he can get a little more nuance into his pass rush you don't expect a ton from your nose tackle to begin with. And basically, in a, especially in the 3-4, when you're talking two gaps, it's not necessarily about sacks. It's not necessarily about numbers. But what you want them to be able to do more consistently is take up those two blockers and push them into the backfield, and that kind of forces the quarterback off his spot. And I think he's, there's, a, there's a possibility he does that. I think he can become that player. 
I think that ceiling is still out there for him as he gets more experience, as he learns to use his hands better. Uh, I think all of that is, is potentially there with a guy like Logan. Some of the other guys, I think, that's hit their ceiling. I think Cedric Thornton uh, is what he is. He's a very good run de- defender, but he's not going to uh, go much higher than this in his career. And, and the backups are the backups for a reason. And, and Bear, specifically, hasn't had a lot of reps because he wasn't dressing at first, and then he got injured. But when he has been out there, He's exactly what the Eagles want in that five technique because he's so long and rangy, and he's been able to to get his hands up and bat balls, and he's been been able to be very effective. And I would be surprised if when he's completely healthy if he hasn't overtaken Taylor Hart. They had high expectations for him, but he hasn't lived up to him to this point. Let's segue into him. Uh, Biggest disappointment is I would assume that Hart has been that guy then. Yeah, I mean, they wanted him to take a big step forward in, in his second year, and he did. He got in shape. He completely remade his body from uh, his rookie season, and uh, they thought he was uh, – because if you think about it, last year Bear was the guy dressing for all 16 games, and Hart wasn't dressing. So uh, all of a sudden we, he, we hit week one, and it's been the exact opposite. Hart was the guy, uh, and Bear kind of took the step back. Uh, but it hasn't worked out. He hasn't given them much, certainly no splash plays. He's been nondescript. You know, when he's on the field, you don't really notice him, and and that's not something you want from, obviously, a front seven player. You want to see an occasionally a flash, whether it's a, a tackle behind the line of scrimmage or or even if he's just, you know, two-gapping people and, and, and tying up those blockers, so Brandon Graham or, or – Connor Barwin can make a play. I haven't seen enough of that from Taylor Hart. I, I like to get your thoughts too on Curry. You know, you mentioned uh, it's just not going to happen for Vinny Curry. He's a guy that seems like when he's given the opportunity, he's around the, the quarterback all the time. We know that this is not the right fit, but he's still around the quarterback a lot. Why uh, can they not figure out what to do with him? Yeah, as I said, it's just not going to happen. It's but it's not going to happen here. I, I think Vinny Curry's a very good player. He's just a, a natural four-three weak side end. He doesn't fit in in this scheme. Uh, they have a tough time getting him on the field. They tried to move him to outside linebacker. I think that was the last attempt to to make him fit in this particular scheme. And when that didn't work out, I think you kind of know uh, he's going to make plays at times when he's out there because. He can get to the quarterback, and he's the best edge rusher this team has. Uh, but they don't like him as a fit for this defense long term, and I think it's just a situation where he's going to move on to a to a system that's a better fit for his skill set. John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. Check out his uh, bye week previews of the Eagles. They're all posted right now at 97.3 ESPN.com, the bye week breakdowns, I should say, uh, as he looks at the defensive side of the ball right now in all of John's Eagles coverage. Uh, click on the trending bar, McMullen's Eagles coverage. You get it all right there, and he'll have plenty as the Eagles get ready for the Dallas Cowboys next week. We've talked a lot about the Eagles going into the week, and obviously – uh, Chip Kelly and, and Sam Bradford. But let's look inside this division this week, and we've talked a lot about Des Bryant this week. He's listed as questionable. Uh, the expectation is that he will play. They're going to play this Seahawks team. Uh, you know, if you look at that game, if Des Bryant plays with Tony Romo, do you like Seattle still on the road in that game? I would in that instance simply because you have the rust. Uh, maybe if they were playing the entire time, Romo and Des Bryant, you would look more towards the Cowboys, uh, especially because of the season the Seahawks had. But uh, that's what people kind of overlook in the fact that when these guys do get back, whether it's this week or next week for Des, and when Tony eventually gets back, there's going to be uh, a, a period where you have to shake that rust off. They're not going to be the exact same playmakers they were before the injuries. It's just not the way it works. So uh, you always say it's not who you play, it's when you play them. And, and obviously during this stretch without Romo and Des Bryant, that's exactly when you wanted to play the Dallas Cowboys. They're not the same. They've been the same team. And they're not going to be the same team until both of them 
are back and completely healthy. Yeah, we're, I'm real interested to see uh, if Dez even goes. I know he's listed as questionable. I know he wants to play, but you wonder if uh, the Cowboys are just so desperate that they're going to make that, that they're going to let him play, uh, or whether he's re- re- realistic, uh, legitimately healthy enough to play. Well, sometimes you have to hold back the player uh, for his own sake, and I've said this from the start. If I were the Cowboys, I'd hold him back and I'd get him ready for the division game, and I'd, I'd put pull the reins uh, just because of the type of injury. And you understand a bone has to have a certain amount of time to heal, and you know the last thing you want is for that injury to be aggravated. So I think it would make far more sense. Uh, to wait for the division game and give him a full extra week. But we all know Jerry Jones, and we all know how he handles his business. He's basically on the radio every week acting like he's a doctor and saying this is going to happen and that's going to happen. He does things a different way. And uh, we've talked about the way the Cowboys are and and the fact that their fan base hope and and belief that this is going to turn around. And the easiest way to do that is to get Des Bryant on the field. So I think both sides are pushing for it. I think the player naturally is pushing for it, and, and the organization's pushing for it, and I think that might be the wrong decision. Got a lot to dive into here with John. Uh, last night's game, the Patriots, I mean, they just, again, uh, impressive. But what I want to get your opinion on uh, is the Thursday night football games. I mean, it just seems, again, you got an ugly game, not competitive. The road team struggles again. Uh, and it's evident the players don't like it. And you ask that coupled with the fact of this sad story with uh, Jeremiah Ratliff uh, today. And, you know, obviously uh, the, the, it felt like he was uh, killing – felt like he wanted to kill everybody. You know, these Thursday night games, a bad product. Uh, how hypocritical is the NFL to continue to put these games on? Pretty hypocritical if you think about the safety aspect part of it because – uh, they push so much, and, and uh, obviously there's legal entanglements, and they have to do certain things. Uh, but on one hand, you, you constantly talk about the safety of the players, and, and you have to do everything possible to keep, keep this game safe moving forward. And then you have these Thursday night games, because we all know why. It's an extra money grab, and there's a significant amount of money by adding another TV package to this incredible a deal that they have, which people always talk about the NFL and how much money it generates, and it's over $9 billion a year at this point. Oh. But understand, $3 billion of that, almost 33% comes directly from television revenue. Uh, so if if this product would ever dip uh, in, in the public's eye and those TV ratings took a hit and CBS and Fox and ESPN and everybody else would decide you know, this isn't as valuable as we thought it was because, let's face it, TV is changing. There's a, a lot of over-the-top uh, stuff as far as the Internet and as far as live streaming. What was? Let me, let, me, it, let me ask you on that real quick. Uh, the Yahoo game last week, what, what was the reaction? Do you think we'll see more of that? Uh, I, had, I watched it. Uh, I didn't have any real issues with it in terms of uh, the streaming. I didn't have the, the pausing. I watched it from my phone through my Google Chromecast. It was on my big screen, so I had no clue. You would not have known if you walked in my house that this was streaming on a website. So uh, was this uh, deemed a success, and can we anticipate more? Well, it it was deemed a success by some. You you saw those numbers, and and people – some people laughed at them and some people took them as gospel as far as how many people tuned in and I'm with you I watched the game and I didn't have a problem with the streaming other people did there were a lot of reports there were a lot of issues and other uh, people that do that major league baseball advanced media is generally uh, tops in that industry they've had issues in the past Uh, world wrestling entertainment has had issues in the past with live streaming And, and they're at the forefront of it but the one thing you have to understand is Yahoo paid $20 million for that game. And while that sounds like a lot, it, it's almost, it, that doesn't sound like a, it doesn't only sound like a lot. $20 million for one game between two bad teams, it almost sounds like, like somebody at Yahoo should be put uh, in an insane asylum. But I'm assuming that there was justification for it. Yeah, I mean, that's a bargain for an NFL product. 
again, what I was saying before, they get three billion with a B billion dollars a year from the TV networks for 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 their games. So twenty million is a drop in the bucket, and the concern is that you can't monetize uh, over the top streaming services nearly as well as broadcast television. And that's what the NFL has to deal with because as, as younger people get into their uh, wheelhouse, so to speak, and those are that's the demographic that's more comfortable with the streaming stuff where they don't want to deal with it, they don't understand it, they just want to turn on CBS or Fox. But as that changes, all of a sudden the NFL and every other sports league, not just them, has to figure out how to monetize this better because it's difficult if that three billion dollars goes away, it, it's not going to be easy to replace it. That's everywhere, though. I mean, what you do uh, in terms of writing at uh, today's pigskin and doing uh, writing stuff online. The biggest problem is we know everyone's consuming your writing and stuff online, but the the problem seems to be that the advertisers don't really trust uh, or get the right feedback on a banner ad or uh, whatever it may be. Uh, in the online, yeah, and that and, has been and, the biggest problem. Yeah, it's tremendously frustrating because, as you know, uh, it, it's not as concrete. So when somebody in the old days would put down a quarter for a newspaper to read uh, a story on the Eagles, you knew that money was coming in, uh, and it's a different uh, distribution model, and people are trying to figure it out, and that's the entire problem, as you said, with not only our industry but TV, newspapers, everything. Everybody's trying to figure out how to monetize it correctly. Uh, even newer companies, Twitter, Facebook, everybody. And the NFL's just one of a, a, a million trying to do it, and they're trying to stay ahead of the curve, and that's why you saw that first streaming game on Yahoo. Uh, you know, I, I was saying earlier about the Thursday nighters and, and the streaming thing. If, if that streaming thing becomes almost a weekly type of thing, or instead of a Thursday night game, I know it's the NFC on Fox and the AFC on CBS, but why can't a third uh, network get involved on Sunday afternoon and just pick up a game, you know, pick up another game, you know, do a, do a random game. They can pick up a, you know, whatever game that, that the other two networks choose that they don't want. Even if it's the fourth game, that team, that, that network is going to have people uh, watching. I mean, that could almost recoup the Sunday night game because those Sunday night games are bad anyway. Or the, I'd say Thursday, Thursday night game. The Thursday, Thursday night, night games game. are bad. So whatever game would have been the Thursday night game, that's the game that goes on to the, the other network uh, instead of playing them on Thursday nights. Yeah, and it all comes down. I mean, if they could get it done with the same amount of money, they would certainly consider doing it. I mean, that's the bottom line. They get a significant amount of money for that Thursday night package, and no streaming company in the world would match it not that they can't, because some of them, whether it's Yahoo or Google, certainly have the capability to pay that kind of money, but they just don't see the revenue at, at, at this point that TV networks do when they sell advertising. So until that changes, it's going to be hard to move away from the traditional model and, and go into the streaming model until, unless, People stop watching, well, and, and to that point, that hasn't happened to this point. Wasn't so. the the Yahoo game? Wasn't it just literally a CBS feed? I mean, it seemed like it was. It had CBS uh, yeah. graphics yeah. and everything. And that's why. And the NFL Network, when they morphed the Tuesday product, and it's shown both on uh, Thursday product. Excuse me, and, it, and it, it's shown on both NFL Network and CBS at the same time. It's just the CBS feed on both. Uh, and and that has actually allowed them to save some money because they don't have to worry about uh, actually producing the program, the NFL itself, uh, because the NFL network is a house organ. So they enjoy the fact that somebody else is, is shouldering the burden of the cost of televising the game, and that's always the most desirous situation for the league itself. Uh, John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com, is uh, the NFL week number seven, getting ready to get uh, what well, got underway last night. We saw the Patriots rip uh, the Miami Dolphins, and uh, Dolphins had a big loss in that game too. Cameron Wake 
going to be done for the year, so that might change my who's in, who's out on Tuesday uh, as the Dolphins' defense takes a big blow. Uh, we got Green Bay and Denver. That is the Sunday nighter. Two undefeated teams. you got offense versus defense there, so uh, really a marquee matchup there. Uh, other really interesting games as well. I'm interested in the Jets and Oakland. I want to see if Oakland can really put together two uh, back-to-back ones. you got the Dallas-Seattle. you got New York. Obviously, playing New Orleans, that's a big game inside the NFC East. So, uh, good football. And then, of course, Carolina, uh, we'll get to uh, see if they can follow that up and stay undefeated. So, a good Week 7 uh, slate here. John and I will be live at the Golden Nugget on Tuesday to recap it all and get you ready for the Eagles and the Cowboys. All right, John, have a good weekend. And, uh, man, it's, uh, this week should be interesting. If the if the Cowboys lose the game this week, does that take any luster off the game coming up? Uh, a little bit, but we all know the, the NFC East is going to be jumbled, so I, I don't think it takes too much. Uh, but at some point, we've said it for weeks and weeks and weeks, the Cowboys have to find a way, even if it's just one game. they got to win one, uh, preferably two, until Tony Romo gets back, and then they would have a chance to win this division. If the, so it starts now. It's getting less and less time. they got to win one of these games. If the Giants lose, they'd be 4-4. Four and four. If the Cowboys lose, they'd be 2-5. and five. They'd be a game and a half behind the Giants with a loss if they both lose this week. And obviously Philadelphia and Washington cannot do anything. So uh, you're right. Not a lot of separation would happen if both teams lose, which is very possible this weekend. John McMullen? at J.F. McMullen on Twitter. Thanks, John. Have a good weekend.